Uh, but I'm going to welcome everybody to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is San Francisco Dharma Collective. And tonight we are about to, we are just about to abide in the fifth stage of the Bodhisattva practice, the stage of Sadur Jaya. And just to make sure we know, you know, where we are and what's going on here, right? We've been reading this Akshayamati Bodhisattva Sutra and the Buddha has been telling the Bodhisattva Akshayamati all about the practices of the Bodhisattva, beginning with the 10 paramitas and the 10 practices of each of the 10 paramitas. And then the Buddha began to describe to the Bodhisattva Akshayamati these, well, these uh, things. This, our, our classic translation would call these visions. These are the 10 visions of a Bodhisattva. And we have been going through, and this is, you know, tonight I wanted to, to take a moment to, to pause and remind us all sort of, you know, there's a lot, we're, we're juggling a lot of things now, which is that there are these stages of the Bodhisattva, 10 in number. And I mentioned at the outset that these 10 stages sort of correspond to the paramitas. So we kind of have that in mind. Oh, we're, we're about to abide in the stage of this and we're doing this paramita and then we're having this, you know, it's like a lot of different elements here. And indeed, I actually think that's part of the, the learning or part of the pedagogy of, well, definitely this sutra, the Akshayamati Bodhisattva Sutra, which is that we have been through the 10 paramitas and now we're going deeper and we, we can't forget those, right? And so this is the, the fifth, so this is, this is what I mean is that it's like this, this confluence of ideas that are about to happen. The Bodhisattva is practicing these 10 paramitas. And in the cultivation of those 10 paramitas heading towards Buddhahood, there are these, and, and, and I wanted to start tonight by re addressing this issue of, of what these are, because this is, this is quite, a, quite a vision here. And I wanted to make clear some very interesting things that are going on. So yeah, yeah. So even before we get to all the stuff, it's about this idea of having a vision. And again, that is the, the language that this treasury of Mahayana Sutras, it's the language that they use, that the Bodhisattva will have a vision. And you know, of course, what's, what's tricky about that is the, the actual Chinese that refers to some Sanskrit, it's not much more helpful in understanding exactly what this means. And tonight is a very, uh, the reason why I'm digressing back to this idea of what are these visions is because of this particular one tonight. It's very tricky, <clears throat> it's very tricky. And so I wanna remind everybody to, if we, you go back, I don't know how many episodes of the Dharma Doors to when we first embarked on these stages, we, if you go back, what I talked about that night was that these are, well, in Chinese, they are called xiang. Uh, it will be our fourth tone, xiang. And this xiang, always, of course, in Chinese Buddhist texts, refers to this Sanskrit idea of lakshana. In, indeed, almost a Buddhist Sanskrit idea that the word is lakshana. And, you know, if you've been coming to the Dharma doors or you study with me, you hear about lakshana a lot because that's sort of 
a very interesting aspect of uh, Buddhist philosophy, Buddhist psychology, Buddhist phenomenology, all kinds of Buddhist sciences. And it's this, this way of thinking about the characteristics of things. And so whether it's the color orange or the sound being loud or quiet or a, a smell being of a certain quality or a taste being sweet or savory or sour, all of these are lakshana. Xiang, as the Chinese would say. And what, of course, gets, you know, if it wasn't complicated enough about the characteristics and qualities of things, then we find out that the bodhisattva, before each of these stages, will have one of these xiang, one of these lakshana. And it's like, what, what, what? And I, I thought of something very interesting. And it's a very interesting way to begin tonight to talk about Lakshana, to talk about these visions. And what, like, how does, how does that idea of a characteristic or quality of something, how does that become a vision? And what's interesting is that we have a very similar um, linguistic structure, a kind of very similar linguistic framework in English. And the, the linguistic framework or linguistic structure I'm thinking of, it, it has to do with um, the word appearance. And indeed, the, the word lakshana and the Chinese character xiang are often translated into English as appearance. And so in, in English, we may say, oh, uh, you saw uh, so-and-so last night? How did they appear? How did they, how did they appear? And, and you might say, oh, they, they, seem, they, looked, they seemed a little sad. They, they seemed, uh, you know, whatever, right? So you would ascribe some, some characteristics or qualities to how they appeared, by which I mean in English, how they looked. Like how, how did they appear? So you say to somebody, oh, how did they appear? And you say, oh, they, they appeared a little sad. And somebody would say, no, I don't mean how they appeared. I don't mean how did they look? I mean, was it a Zoom call? Did you FaceTime? Did you actually meet like, how did they appear? By, by what means? By how, how did they appear? Not how did they appear, but how did they appear? And you, you may say, oh, it was, a, it was a Zoom. It was a Zoom call. That is how they appeared. And of course, what gets very interesting about that is how that appearance, the appearance via Zoom or via FaceTime or via whatever medium, but that, that is also part of that other appearance. Oh, they appeared two-dimensional. <laughs> <laughs> they they appeared they appeared to, to be they appeared to be a two dimensional flat uh, thing that I was ascribing three dimensionality to, and the thing that was flat that I was ascribing three dimensionality to, I was ascribing sadness to. So it, it, we could go on and on in a funny Buddhist way, but what I mean is, this word appearance in English is it's, a, it's like a really kind of a funny word if you start thinking about it. And I don't want to trip anybody out. So let's not think about that word too long. The idea is, is that the bodhisattva will have a, a, a you know, and this is where uh, um, Chang and company, the translators of this volume, they, of course, I'm sure were in a meet in a room and they were like, what do we do with this idea? What is going on here? And, and I mentioned when we began this process back at the first stage, 
I, I think I mentioned, I actually may not have mentioned, so let me mention, these appearances that we have been describing, the, what, what, what they call visions, these visions you know, I don't know. I don't, you know, I've, I've been doing my best to, to give you enough information, you know, to, to come up with your own ideas in that way. But I don't know if these are dreams. I, I kind of have a feeling they're somewhat between a dream and a daydream, like a vision in that way. But again, I don't know. It might be an actual like hallucinatory vision. This might all be code for new ways of seeing the world always? I don't know. And so I want to really, I wanted to begin tonight by throwing all that out there so that we go into tonight's Xiang, <laughs> right? Tonight's Lakshana, tonight's vision, tonight's appearance. I wanted to go into it tonight a little more complicated um, in that sense of like, rather than just glossing it as the Bodhisattva will have a vision that they will see flowers everywhere. I wanted to remind us that I'm, I'm not exactly sure what exactly these refer to, although maybe by the end of the night, I'll, I'll offer some ideas, some further ideas. <laughs> okay, so that, now, now we can start. Now we can start the, uh... tonight, this is the vision or appearance, Xiang. Lakshana that the Bodhisattva will have before, right as they right before they are about to abide in the fifth bumi, the fifth stage of the Bodhisattva path, and this stage is called Sudurjaya, <clears throat> which is translated as difficult to conquer, hard to conquer difficult to master, hard to master. Uh, those are the, all the variations I have seen of this Sadur Jaya. Indeed, the Chinese, um, did I, I didn't write it on the board, um, this uh, non, non sheng, th this idea is about difficult or hard to master or conquer. And when I first, started studying the 10 bodhisattva stages a long time ago, I thought that this title, Sudurjaya, referred to the, the fifth bumi, that the fifth bumi is hard to master. It's hard to conquer. It's hard. It's difficult. Like, and, and when you hear, you know, about the fifth, what the fifth bumi stage is all about, it's like, oh, that, that, yeah, that might be hard. But actually, the more that I have studied and learned about the 10 Bhumi stages, it is actually Sudarjaya is the Bodhisattva, is about the Bodhisattva who abides in the fifth stage, that they are difficult to conquer. They are difficult to master. They're hard, hard to, to conquer. And so that kind of changes it in a, in a way where it's not about the difficulty or, or whatever of the stage, it's about the one, the bodhisattva who abides in that stage. And so if you're wondering, well, well that sounds interesting to be a in, indomitable, to be an indomitable spirit, to be a inconquerable bodhisattva, that, that sounds good. What, is the, what does the Buddha say about achieving such a stage of indomitability or inconquerability. Well, that's where we add this, uh, this level to what we're talking about, which is that each of the 10 stages corresponds to one of the aforementioned 10 paramitas. And so the fifth paramita is the paramita of dhyana, otherwise known as meditation, often synonymous with sati or mindfulness. That is the paramita, the excellence or the perfection, the, the, the virtue, the quality of dhyana, in particular dhyana, this idea of meditation in 
the realm of pure form. Uh, calm, cool states of being. That is how one becomes indomitable or unconquerable. However, I would like to um, refer very quickly because this is actually about you know, it's this is where I get into a little bit, not of trouble, but it's where it gets tricky because the bodhisattva who has been diligently practicing the paramitas, they, you know, they first have the, this, this, these vision of a jeweled filled world. And then they have this vision of a, a lotus jeweled filled world, you know, and then they have this vision of themselves conquering enemies and they have these, these visions that we've been speaking about. And so it is actually before one abides in the stage of indomitability or unconquerability. It's before that, that one has this vision. And so I wanted to, I, 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 that might all have been very vague but I actually wanted to try to tie together how the, the paramitas are functioning with the stages that are functioning with these visions. They're, they're very kind of distinct things that this is a vision that, will, that one will have before they abide in a stage that will come about through practicing certain things, certain qualities or virtues. So there's kind of a matrix of understanding in that way, right? And so the vision with, with, with no further ado, the, the vision that a bodhisattva will have, and why don't I, I'll just read from, I'll read from the, the standard English translation here. Interesting, so they, I didn't even really realize. So they translate this stage as invincible strength. I, I, I don't, I, I, the invincible strength. When a bodhisattva is about to abide in the stage of sadur jaya, invincible strength, they will first have a vision of a woman with garlands of atimuttaka flowers, varishika flowers, and kampaka flowers on their heads and various adornments on their bodies. That's it. <clears throat> I'm going to read my translation really quickly. So, and, I, and I'm, gonna, I'm going to explain why I, I translate this a little differently, but uh, bodhisattva mahasattvas, these great beings, these great bodhisattvas about to abide in the fifth stage, difficult to master, will first have this appearance, have this sign, have this lakshana. They will see women crowned in atimuttaka flowers, vashika flowers, and kampaka flowers their bodies draped in all kinds of adornments. <laughs> so a few slight differences there. I've, I've actually reduced tonight's vision. This is a very classic Chinese thing to do. It's why I love the Chinese language. They have a beautiful way of reducing things and then you can reduce them further and reduce them further. So I have actually reduced this vision to this uh, qua uh, two quatrains, two four character things. Uh, on their heads, they will be crowned with flower garlands and on their bodies draped with adornments. Those are the two ideas that we are given here. And of course, we are given three particular kinds of flowers that I have, I have information. I got data about these flowers, but that's the vision. And the first thing that we need to address is a grammatical issue 
that will bring us to our our first sort of interpretation. I'm going to offer a number of ways to interpret this vision. Um, again, usually based on other sutras, based on other Dharma knowledge, but we need to address one issue. And it's the fact that, ooh, you know, you get into, you get into classical Chinese, which is the, that is the more or less the language that we're dealing with. Yeah, we're also sort of dealing with a little bit of um, classical or medieval Sanskrit as well, but we are left with a conundrum about whether this is a vision of a woman, some women, or women. The Bodhisattva will have a vision of a woman crowned with these flowers, draped in these adornments, or the Bodhisattva will have a vision of some, some, like a group, some women with flowers in their hairs, draped in adornments, or the Bodhisattva will have a vision of women being crowned with these flowers draped in adornments. I will, even though, even though I have drawn or attempted to draw what, what I imagine, and this of course, you know, I'm doing the best I can with marker or whatever, but the idea is I've chosen to just show you the one, the woman. But linguistically, I need to tell you that in Chinese, because the way it reads, there is a suggestion that it's plural. It's not conclusive though. It's not at all conclusive in Chinese, whether it's plural or not. But there's, some, there's something that lends itself to interpreting it as being plural rather than singular. And indeed, the standard English translation has gone plural. That the Bodhisattva here will have a vision uh, um, uh, of, of women with garlands of flowers in their hair. So they've gone plural. I, I get it and I agree. Now the question is whether it is sort of a vision of all women or a, uh, 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 just plural, like a group of them. Uh, by the way, <laughs> um, if anybody's concerned, like, Michael, you're really just skipping past this very dualistic man-woman thing going on, don't worry, we're, we're getting there. I'm, I'm, de I'm treading very lightly into those waters of the, the, the vast polarity of this vision. But first, <laughs> linguistics, first grammar. <laughs> there does seem to be, again, an indication in the Chinese that we are dealing with a vision of multiple women. And on that note, uh, yeah, uh, let's, this, wow, wow. What do you want first? What do you want first? It's like, who, like, who are these women? Or what are these flowers all about? I mean, that's, that's really what I'm, where the crosswords roads I'm at right now. I feel like we gotta talk about who these women might be, right? Yeah, okay. So there was a gentleman that I don't see in the gallery, but again, I'm always technologically, <laughs> like I can't really know, but there was a gentleman in last week's session who at the end mentioned regarding the flowers being scattered all over from the four directions. And you, who, sir, who you were, Bodhisattva, Bodhisattva, whoever you were, who mentioned that, they said, oh, that sounds like when the Buddha was under the Bodhi tree and he held up his, the Abhaya Mudra and all of the arrows of Mara turned into flowers scattering everywhere. I was blown away because that's a flower scattering everywhere 
connection that I hadn't really seen. And yet it's so obvious. It's like, wow. And the reason why that connection with last week's vision of uh, rare flowers scattering everywhere from the four directions, the reason why that's a really excellent interpretation and read of last week is because it needs to be kept in mind that we're talking about the bodhisattva path. And what the bodhisattva path means is that it's the path towards Buddhahood. It's the path towards your you, you bodhisattva. It's the path towards your moment of sitting under the tree of enlightenment and achieving supreme unsurpassable enlightenment. So what it means to be a bodhisattva is to be treading the same path as the Buddha. And I mentioned this in, in, at some point during the sutra that in the Mahayana Buddhist tradition, the Buddha's life story of being born, you know, like in the palace and, and, and kind of having everything that they want, but then the Buddha gives up that security and comfort of the palace to seek renunciation and goes through the trials and tribulations of meditation and renunciation, and then achieves enlightenment under the Bodhisattva or under the Bodhi tree. That in the Mahayana tradition becomes an archetypal journey, indeed in a kind of Jungian way where that is the spiritual journey of every practitioner. And so we don't look to the life story of the Buddha. We don't look to the life story of the Bodhisattva. We don't look to that as a historical event. We look at it as a timeless, eternal recurrence. And so that's why I think last week, the gentleman who offered that reading, it's like, that's, ex wow, I was blown away because that's a, such a great read of that moment of seeing uh, flowers scattered everywhere. I don't think, again, I don't think it's the exclusive only reading of that. I think what's beautiful about this, you know, like poetry is that you can have many readings. That's what's great. But that one is important, especially because there's a very, very strong possibility to th that these women that are being envisioned by the Bodhisattva in this stage are this sort of new Mahayana way of talking about Mara's daughters. And so if you will remember another part of the Bodhisattva path, first, the Buddha is challenged by fear. Mara strings a bow with a thousand arrows and lets all thousand arrows fly at the Buddha and with the Abhaya Mudra, the Mudra of fearlessness, the, the arrows turn to flowers and scatter everywhere. That's the first challenge. The second challenge to the Bodhisattva under the Bodhi tree is Mara manifests sensual desire in the form of these women who sort of, uh, you know, Tradition is, is that they were kind of scantily dressed and they are sort of, you know, in trying to entice the Buddha out of his dhyana, out of his meditative state. And the story is the Buddha offers the giving, the, the, this mudra, and in this way sort of doesn't take, does not take from the women, but offers compassion, kindness in that way. So there is a great way insofar as this represents the Bodhisattva path to, coro to correlate this with that moment under the Bodhi tree. Again, I'm not saying it's the only way to read this, but I think it's a pretty slick, a slick way to read this. But but it, it doesn't matter though, because let's, let's get out of the mythology for a second. 
what I what I believe is being sort of addressed here, and again, it's going to get tricky. You know, we we have a lot to dissect, and I don't want to offer too much uh, commentary before I've heard from everybody. But I, I do just want to suggest that this, I, I kind of foreshadowed this uh, two weeks ago. And it's when I mentioned that for me, like as an interpreter, it was a little hard for me to miss that the, uh, the Bodhisattva having a vision of themselves in armor with a weapon, defeating enemies, that seemed kind of masculine to me. And this gets tricky because I actually think, I actually think I'm doing the sutra a disservice by even bringing it down into these terms because I think it's trying to be a little more transcendent. But what I'm getting at though is, is that I think that, I think that it would be like, you know, dishonest in a way of the tradition to completely ignore these things. And by that, I don't mean male behavior and female behavior. I'm not, I, I try my all the time not to fall into such ridiculous bifurcated dualistic traps. But we, all, we live in a world that is affected by such ridiculous bifurcated dualistic traps. And Buddhism is aware that we live in a world that is infiltrated by ridiculous bifurcated dualistic traps. And so I couldn't help but see in the, the vision of the Bodhisattva clad in armor, holding their weapon, a kind of this, I don't know, again, it's a masculine energy, but it's a subdued masculine energy. It's a very like, uh, chill, fearless, you know, that message was about fearlessness in that way. But regardless, this is like a yin and yang thing. It's like, it's not even about these things. It's about that that was a kind of energy. And tonight's a different energy. T tonight is a very different vibe. And what I'm suggesting is, is that while we would, while we, are enlightened bodhisattvas. And definitely while, you know, we're studying this bodhisattva, Akshaya Mati Bodhisattva Sutra, and we're deep in this Dharma study, we're, we're really practicing our non-duality. But there's a way in which we do live in this kind of dualistic world that the bodhisattva path is about transcending. And so I would suggest that this is about, oh, it's so tricky because it's like, I want to say that it's, a, it's about the exact opposite of objectification. And yet it has a slightly objectifying quality to it. That's, it's what I'm addressing there's a slight objectifying aspect to this that I'm trying to be like really progressive about, like really on top of and being aware of, oh, wow, interesting that we're, we're gawking and gazing at women, but we are having an armor and cudgel. It's like a kind of an interesting thing, but I think the message of this stage or the message of what is about to happen, because again, these are visions that a bodhisattva has right before they abide in this stage. I do believe it is about sort of, well, we will, we'll need to get deeper into the adornments and the flowers in a second. But again, I do think it's about a kind of, um, uh, it's a, yeah, it's about a way, it's about the, um, It's, yeah, it's about how we see the world. It's about how we see the world and what it would really mean to see the world and those in it desirelessly. Like what it would really mean to sort of 
um, not objectify someone, to not sexualize someone, to not do all that. What would that look like then? And indeed the Bodhisattva about to abide in the stage that is hard, difficult to master, that is marked by a mastery of dhyana, there is a mastery of impartiality in that way, a very a deep mastery of that idea of equanimity within that realm. And so I think this is about what that looks like. <laughs> okay, questions, answers, ideas before we get into a deeper discussion of the three kinds of flowers and what it means to be draped in adornments. Questions, answers, ideas? No. Oh, gosh. Yeah, I'm just going to go out on a limb here. Yeah. I'm just going to go for it. Um, it seems to me that a lot of the problems that you're alluding to, referencing, and that come up for someone like me reading the sutra have to do with the gendering. And if we could separate the gendering from the qualities, it would be fine. Like when the bodhisattva is, you know, holding a sword and whatever, that's a certain type of energy that we all have regardless of our gender. And it doesn't, it's when you gender it that it becomes a problem because then you're like, you know, is that, is that a male thing? Well, no, because if a female does it, then it's a female thing. And if a non-binary person, does, I mean, it just doesn't, why does it have to be associated with a gender? Same with garlands in your hair. You know, we get into trouble when garlands in your hair are only allowed for females and not allowed for males, right? And even and why why even gender it and and then I just want to point out that in addition to the whole gender thing going on here, there's a there's a like a, a heteronormativity going on here. Like, not only am I like I the I of this story, the protagonist uh, is a male, but th they find females attractive. Like, and again, if we just remove the gender from it. And I don't want to sound like, I'm not saying let's be, you know, gender blind. That's not what I'm saying at all, but let's not associate a gender with a quality, you know, because people have genders. Most people associate them or, you know, identify as a particular gender. And, um, but to you know, tie that, to bind that to a quality is where we get in trouble in my opinion going out on a limb. <laughs> Thank you for listening. I hear you, Noam. I hear you. And, you know, I, I certainly wouldn't have voluntarily really went out on this if indeed the text was not so explicitly binary in this regard. It, in, in fact, in many ways, even, you know, for someone like me who's read a bunch of Buddhist texts, I was a little like, wow, they're being so exacting about it. Like it, it, there, are, there are gentler, I don't wanna say gentler, but there's more ambiguous ways in Chinese to be more broad about language. They have chosen the most direct way to make it unavoidable that they're talking uh, women in that way. And so I couldn't avoid it. I couldn't avoid addressing it and no, I really appreciate what you, everything you said. I agree <laughs> with everything you said. And that's where I'm in this kind of, you know, it's a precarious situation because the text just says what it says. And I don't want to, I certainly don't want to come across as supporting such deep binary oppositions because I, I, I think such deep binary <laughs> oppositions are lame. I think I've made that abundantly clear in that way. But Michael. it's... Um, yeah. Yeah. What, what comes to my mind is uh, obviously this is a very interesting conversation. Uh, we could speak hours around it. I What I find is, you know, talking about gender and the quali qualities of male and female, this is, this is not a problem. The quality of a woman 
is not a problem. There are qualities that are more feminine, you know, and more masculine. And then in, in Buddhism, you find these beautiful um, um, stories and uh, explanations where, yes, this is the feminine energy, right? Like, so I think we just, we, we make a problem out of it. Mm -hmm. Like, I think that then there's, you know, male, female, and in, you know, in between, this is not the problem. It, it's always, it's never the object, the appearance in we can even think th th thinking about appearance in general anger is never the problem um you know like any event is never the problem an object is never the problem gender so it's always our relationship to it and i think i really want to make this this distinction because i think it is important because um at because sometimes we've fallen into the trap um of spiritual um, bypassing, maybe mm -hmm. in a sense of like we come to the point where everything is one and in general, you know, everything is one. Well, then it doesn't leave us a lot of uh, room and space and 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 uh, stuff to to talk about, right? I think that's oftentimes in Buddhism and in Hinduism when you don't want to have like in discussions or no avoid discussions about certain topics then you either say everything is an illusion and there is no gender in general or everything um, is one and i think no we live in a in the three-dimensional matrix at least mm -hmm. most of us so and the three-dimensional matrix has some characters and qualities so anyway i just wanted to um throw that in <laughs> thank you connie and i i appreciate you saying all that really i really think that voices a lot you know uh, all, uh, a lot of ideas between you and Noam. a lot of ideas are presented and i again this is really great i want to it, actually anybody else before i sort of try to because i really I, don't, I would like to this to be an open conversation in that way yeah, no. I just want to say one more thing. This is not in response to what you said, Connie. It's something that Michael said earlier. It, I think that uh, sometimes the tying of certain characteristics to certain genders is reinforces the idea that gender is a binary. And I, I, maybe I'm disagreeing with you, Connie, here, but we can take this, you know, outside later. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But but just the the idea that you know. Uh, you know, let's just take adorning oneself with flowers and holding a dagger like that they're at the opposite ends of some spectrum. No, they're like two qualities that any human being may or may not have at any given moment, regardless of their gender. So just, yeah. Oh, absolutely. No. And I really, it's, it's really what I've come here tonight to try to articulate is about how I actually think that this sutra and this Mahayana Buddhist tradition that this sutra represents is quite enlightened regarding actually a lot of the comments that have been made about, especially kind of in a way Connie's comment about these are, this is real. Actually, Noam, you said it too. These are real, these are real things, but we don't necessarily need to uh, uh, put them in such oppositions in that way. And I do believe that is exactly what this sutra is trying to bring together in that way where, and in fact, I feel like I've done a disservice by trying to make the uh, third vision with the armor and the cudgel and I put it in the, the male uh, framework when actually the sutra doesn't, it kind of does because Bodhisattva Akshayamati is male, and I mentioned that, that it keeps referring to the good son, good son, you will have this vision, good son, you will have that vision, so it's hard to avoid the, the male. But my point is, though, let me back it way, 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 way up. 500 BC, 600 BC, if, if you want to push it, the time of the Buddha, this tradition, even at that time, 
was very progressive, very enlightened. And yet, and yet, within the life story of the Buddha, you still get quite a bit of this sharp polarity, and you do get the Mara's daughters as temptresses, and the, the female as temptress is present in early Buddhism. And of course, as I've talked about in uh, classes in the past, early Buddhism suffers a little bit from well, it's actually not even ancient Buddhism that suffers a little bit from sexism. Modern forms of Buddhism suffer a lot from sexism, and that's, that's present. But my point is, though, is that the early Buddhist tradition, as progressive and enlightened as it was, it still had some like holdovers from a slightly less progressive, slightly less in, enlightened moment where women were still the temptress and these things were still couched in those terms. So I actually read this sutra as an advance in the teachings where they have actually stripped an original bodhisattva path that was a little more sharply male to a more general path that it male, female, non-binary beyond. This might fit right in there. However, this sutra is still probably 2,000 years old. And so it's going to still maybe have a little bit of residual holdover, even though they might be wanting to break entirely out of it. They still, maybe 2,000 years ago, were still thinking pretty binarily in terms of men and women and the equality of men and women. And I get, trust me, I get that now we can look back and be like, but that's still not, it's still, I, yeah, trust me. But I do think that this sutra is trying to be progressive in that way by taking older Buddhist metaphors. And now this is not a temptress. That's my point. This is the divine feminine. This is amazing. This is incredible. It's like, it's not even about like a temptation in that way. So I want to, I want to laud this tonight in that way, but I also don't want it to get, be able to get away with any ignorance. Honestly, I'm, I'm, you know, so Connie, Noam, your comments and all, both of your, everything were. <laughs> okay. Little, you want to get into these flowers and these adornments? Okay. Oh, beautiful. So. One, one thing, Michael, what I yeah. thought was interesting that um, obviously the text doesn't speak of, because for me, I knew that the text about women in general, because oftentimes they speak about Dakinis, uh, Taras, right? Um, so, um, or feminine female qualities so if you yeah so it's for me new that it's like the vision of woman you know that's very different so um yeah surprising for me actually <laughs> i i hear you and that's what i mean about the the language here is that you know you um i've already mentioned the uh similar not similarities uh but the correlations between this sutra and the vimalakirti sutra I read a little bit from the Vimalakirti, I've mentioned that. And of course, there is a chapter in the Vimalakirti Sutra, which is the appearance of the goddess. <laughs> and so one can't help but feel a kind of relationship with that chapter, the appearance of the goddess and the appearance of this. However, of course, in the Vimalakirti Sutra, that is a Devi. And there is language in Chinese for a tian or even a tianu, a, a, a goddess, a heavenly divine woman that appears. There's naga, female nagas. There's uh, bhikshunis, female nuns. There's upasakis, uh, female lay devotees. There's even female bodhisattvas, like bodhisattvas who are explicitly spoken about as female. 
And yet in this sutra, they tell you this is a woman or again, women or a group of women. And it's like, again, it's very, uh, like everything we've said, very blunt, very binary, something to think about. So, okay, let's talk flowers, bring it all together. This vision of these women or women or a woman, this vision, they are, so here it is, this show, uh, uh, Die, just die, show die. They have on their heads. And I have chosen, I would actually very much translate this uh, pay, it's pronounced pay. I would translate it as crowned. There is a lot of things to indicate from both of these Chinese characters that they would, would really like to th you to think of these as crowns. And they are three kinds of uh, hua man, this man. And actually you should know, just out of curiosity, you should know that this character, the third one or the fourth one here, it's the character for a mala, like a mala bead or a garland. So if it's little beads, it's a, you know, a mala. But if it has flowers, it's a garland, but it's the same idea. And so these are these uh, wreaths. They're wreaths, cr flower, garland, crowns. <laughs> That's what the language is. And they are ver three very specific flowers. Ati Muttaka, Varshika, and champaka. Let's work backwards. <laughs> so the top of this crown are magnolia champaka flowers, the classic flower for a, a garland, um, uh, nag champa, right? That that these all three of these flowers are known to be incredibly floral. By the way. Um, and there definitely seems to be a, uh, these have definitely been chosen so that when you read these, you smell them. What I mean is, is that I think they are being chosen not for their color association so much as their floral scent. And again, I mentioned like Nag Champa, but just this uh, Champa, um, uh, chapaka, this is general, you know, this is a pretty standard flower, generally used for a garland in that way, and a very standard incense or the base of an incense. The second one is this vishaka or varshika, sorry, varshika. And that's actually, um, I was doing my my flower research. So there is this South East Asian tree, the Aquilaria. And the Aquilaria tree is where you get agar wood from, which would you might know it as aloes wood. And that's what I knew it was, of, of it as, aloes wood. So if you've ever burned aloes wood incense, aloes wood, and there's a beautiful, um, what it's, it's uh, Varshika, the flower that blooms in the rains. And so this aloes wood that blooms in the rains, when it rains, um, again, aloes wood is known for its fragrance. This particular though, Varshika is considered, even at the time, it was considered one of the rarest kinds of agar, or rarest kinds of aloe. So there's that. <laughs> and then the first one that is mentioned is this Ati Muktaka flower, which everybody seems to, um, or it seems to be, I don't know. Um, it's crimson, it's red. That much is, is known, but there is some, 
so what I'm getting at is, is that this particular flower has a lot of lore around it. It is said to be um, many, many feet tall. It's said to be kind of like a heavenly flower. But then in doing a little bit of research, there also seemed to be an indication that Atimutakta flowers, it might be a euphemism for hemp or for cannabis. And as soon as this woman has Nagchampa and Alice Wood and cannabis, this is like a dorm room or so. I don't know. <laughs> I, I joke. I joke. But the idea is, is that these are very special. Let's put it that way. Very special flowers, very fragrant, beautiful, wonderful flowers, right? So anybody have any thoughts about those three? Any uh, arcane knowledge about those three? Anything? They do seem to be, at least the aloes wood in particular has healing properties. So we're kind of in a healing zone with this, but Yeah, I, I don't know either. I don't know either. Um, oh, I, I will tell you this though. Um, and it's just in terms of like my notes based on my research, there are many instances of, in sutras of, uh, in particular in the Lotus Sutra of people making offerings to the Buddha by flame of flowers of these three kinds. And I have yet to find these three together, but each of these individually you will find in sutras as being offerings to the Buddha. So there's that as well. And I couldn't help but notice, and this is, this is where we get really Jungian, like kind of really esoteric, but I got to throw it out there. While we're talking about this uh, situation, there is within the world of esoterica, let's call it that, the notion of the triple crown. Yes, you know it as the famous horse race, but the Pope, uh, the, you might have heard of the, the Pope, the Roman Catholic Church, is famous for the triple crown as well. It's where the euphemism of the triple crown, the horse race comes from the triple crown of the Pope. And these are three kingdoms. And I believe one of the kingdoms is like terrestrial, one of them higher, one of, like there are these various like metaphysical levels of reality or something like that. I don't know, you do, you do the research, but there is the triple crown, which is emblematically represented in the headwear of the bishop, or sorry, the bishop, the pope. And there is of course the horse race, but there's also just, there's not only the triple crown of the pope that represents that, there is in esoterica, a lot of talk about the triple crown. And so I, knowing all of that esoteric knowledge, couldn't help but notice this woman has a triple crown. And that, so I was like, oh, what's, what's up with that? So I don't have any answers. I just pointed out for anybody doing any further research. <laughs> okay, everybody okay with that? Because now we're gonna move on to the adornments. Okay, um, um, I mentioned the, the Malakirti Sutra correlation with the vision of the goddess, but in that chapter, the goddess, it's flowers raining down from the sky and, you know, they're not necessarily a crown in that way. So I'm not really sure what's going on with, with that. So keep that in mind, that correlation with the Vimalakirti Sutra as we move forward. The second part of this, so the first part was head crowned with flower garlands, body uh, 
what is that character? This character is a beautiful character. You don't see this character every day. It's this, I, when I first saw this character, when I was reading the sutra, I was like, what, is, what word is that? It was like one of those things where I was like, I've never seen that character before. It's so beautiful. It's like, it's hard to describe because you would really, you know, it's just this beautiful Chinese language, but it's a weird, uh, this one. So it's this one here and it has, it's a, an interesting character that means to wear something, but it has the root of it is the root of, for wind, it's the wind radical, as they would say. And then it's inside the wind radical that you have the, the, the character for cloth. And then next to that is a person. So it's a person with wind and then cloth inside. So it's just this, you just see it and it's like, oh, that's so beautiful. And then I look it up and I'm like, oh, it means to wear. I can't help but feel that it means draped. It's just like, I was like that word in English, that means draped. <laughs> like, I don't know. So I'm just letting you know how this translation stuff works. You can do all the research you want, but in the end, it's like that character means draped. Yeah, Noe. Is that the same uh, <clears throat> symbol for flow? The one that you're probably thinking of, yeah. which is ex exactly. And that is where when you know Chinese and so you know what, yes, it means wind, but it has a flow to it. And then you see that it's the little character for cloth inside that. Oh, it, it, it's such a beautiful language. It really is. So um, head crowned in the flower garlands, body draped in those. This is the, the idea, the Chuang Yan, if I pronounced that correctly. In Sanskrit, this is known as a Vyuha. A Vyuha is, um, we, I've talked about these. This word occurs so much in Mahayana Buddhism and it gets translated as adornments. And indeed, Zhuang Yan, um, there's interesting cross correlation going on between the, the, these characters because they both have a flower sense of them. So even though this is body uh, draped in adornments, the, the illusion is to like a garlands, but also jewelry, it's what, uh, it's what, sorry, this character. So this one refers more to like a flower garland, this one more to jewelry. And so we are, if we were to take this at face value, take it at just what the words actually mean. Yeah, it means earrings, necklaces, bracelets, things like that. That's what they mean. But it's this whole beautiful um, no, a nomenclature. It's like a kind of a, a nomenclature in Mahayana Buddhism to refer to virtuousness as being like adornments. And it's one of it, it's one of the hardest things to explain. Like, because the it's it's talk about, you know, it's a it's a real leap. But once you get it, it's it's a, such a beautiful idea. And the way that you can think of it, this is just a really simple way to think of it is if somebody showed up to your party or what have you, and they were, they had really fancy earrings on, fancy bracelets, fancy necklaces. And it was like, wow, like they're, they're so gloriously adorned in all of their, their bling or their drip or their shine or whatever, right? They're, wow, look at it all. 
Now imagine somebody shows up and yeah, they don't have jewelry on, but they are the nicest, most truthful person. In the Mahayana Buddhist tradition, they speak of that bodhisattva as being adorned with the virtue of truth, adorned with compassion, adorned with these things. And there's almost a way that if you really just shift your valuation system a little bit and you're like, oh yeah, gold and silver and these things of earrings, those are valuable. And if somebody puts that value on their ears and their neck, wow, that's pretty fancy. But what if you changed your value system so that truth is of the highest equity? Truth is, the, is like way more valuable than any precious substance. And there was somebody that just was covered in it. That's the closest I've gotten to, you know, again, it's something I have a feeling for, but that's the closest I've gotten to being able to articulate this interesting nomenclature in Buddhism, Mahayana Buddhism, of the adornments of a bodhisattva or the adornments of anyone at that, for that matter. So I want you to know that when a sutra, this sutra says that the bodhisattva or this woman or women or whoever is pay is draped in vyuha adornments they are referring to these virtuous qualities in that way however <laughs> and this this is this is where it it, it, it like it's not hard, you know, so what I have drawn here is the best I can do. So my vision here, she has on a Vajra necklace and Vajra bracelets and Vajra bangles. And, you know, so she's draped in Vajras because that's like symbolically the best I could come up with to represent these subtle ideas like virtuous qualities. But what I'm getting at is, is that when you see these images of bodhisattvas and they do have jewelry and they do have adornments, it's like, it's like they did this thing where they made, they made jewelry, not jewelry, and then made jewelry mean something else and then put the jewelry back on. If, if that makes sense. It, it's really hard to explain, but what I mean is, is that when you see those beautiful images of bodhisattvas and they have crowns and they have earrings and they have all of that, it's not necessarily that they were dressed up, <laughs> but they were, they are. I, I'm, getting, I'm getting funny. Any, any questions, comments, or ideas about that? I mean, what I was what, what I'm thinking about um, jewelry on the stuff is I'm thinking about, um, like you said before, about symbolism and thinking about mandalas. And that's, I mean, that's basically why we even have statues, why we have mandalas, why we have representation, because it's just not not trust, but it, it, uh, it, it shows us the nature of our own minds, like as a, as a foundation. And I'm thinking of my teacher is, um, um, the 17th Karmapa and in the Kagyu lineage you have this um, black crown right and in, in certain celebrations the the Karmapa is wearing the black crown which is you know black and golden and huge and he, he actually really wear it because it's so heavy but it's also just a representation right and it's just a reminder and um and um yeah it's it's a symbolism yeah yeah, anyway, a few thoughts. Absolutely, absolutely, Connie. And what your comment made me think of, which is very interesting, is how you take something like a crown, for example, like a, um, and you, you said, like an actual crown, right? 
it's interesting how something like that, a crown like that, is always symbolic. But it's about what it symbolizes. And there's a way in which crowns, of course, can represent I'm more powerful than you. And so Buddhism, or at least this type of Buddhism, which I often refer to as kind of royal Buddhism, because it, it, it adopts the monarchical metaphors, it adopts the, and Tibetan Buddhism is all about the monarchical metaphor. They're all about crowns and empowerments and all of those installings and all of those. And so we kind of have a choice to either just do, be done with that metaphor or we recognize, oh, interesting, crowns are always symbolic. So what if we, what if we use it a different way? And that's gets, you know, that gets interesting, especially when um, I wanted to mention it at the beginning, but it just didn't seem relevant, but it does now. So the reason why when I said that her head would be crowned with garlands, it's interesting because this character for head. There's a few different Chinese characters that one can use for the head. This character, and you can kind of, I mean, you would have to know a little Chinese, but it, it actually is an image of the crown. It's those two little, two little things coming off of the line, which is above an eyeball, because that's the character for an eyeball. And the, the line with the two dots on top of it, this character is very appropriately translated as the crown, meaning like the crown of your head. And so it's a funny double entendre or whatever that we refer to this as the crown and we refer to that as a crown. What I mean is, is that this, this I guess this has to do with why I've mentioned Jung and the archetypal stuff is that I really, really think that these visions that we're going through are really deeply symbolic. And so every little part of it is powerfully meaningful in that way. And so, and I certainly, certainly feel like I've been trying to give you as many interpretations as possible and never try to, I don't want to ever say, and this is what this means, period. Like I would much rather have, and we have had, we have been having a great conversation about these. And again, if I've ever sounded like I've been trying to say it's what something means, I don't, I don't know. But there's a lot of interesting ideas at play, including the role of the, the crown in all of this. So, okay. I, I do have more to say about the, the, the adornments, but any other questions, comments, or ideas about the whole thing, the whole idea, stages, where we're at? Everybody okay with it? Cool. Okay. Um, the the one last point that I wanted to make, and we I've already kind of made it, but it was sort of one of those ideas that I was going to build up to, and it does have to do with these adornments. <laughs> so the other thing that is it's relevant. It's it actually kind of makes this a fun Dharma talk that almost goes full circle. And it's about the, the way that these vyuha, these adornments, it's their relationship to lakshana, to those characteristics and qualities I mentioned at the beginning of the Dharma talk. And so it's this idea that the um, It's about uh, how we perceive people. That's very much, very much, I think, what tonight's vision is about, how we perceive people. And we perceive people, of course, based on their characteristics and qualities. That's, that's the idea. And so from all, all, all kinds of all kinds of ways, right? We sort of deduce 
who somebody is and what they are and all of that based on the quality of their voice, the visual appearance, the way they smell, all of these various things are these lakshana. And without digressing into a wild talk about pranya and pranya paramita and emptiness, without digressing into that dharma talk, I need you to recall how all of these lakshana, all of these characteristics are dependently originated. And it is a somewhat of a, 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 a mental illusion. Is there such an idea? We have optical illusions. <laughs> how about a mental illusion, right? It's a mental illusion that these characteristics and qualities are out there owned and possessed by the person. There's actually this kind of interdependent dance between all of this experience you're having, where you're kind of a co-creator and a co-conspirator in all of this interpretation of qualities in that way. We think they're just out there to be had, but actually there's this dependently originated quality to these things. What I'm getting at is <laughs> these adornments that they speak of in the Mahayana tradition, the reason why they're kind of, it's, it's so interesting, like to, you know, you think of these adornments as like, a, say, earrings, and this idea of like, oh, then it's an, it's an appearance of yours that you have on uh, uh, sapphire earrings. What I'm suggesting is, is that these adornments that a bodhisattva, or in this case, this woman, these adornments, they are, when, when a sutra talks about these adornments, they are understood to be dependently originated. They are, what I mean is, of course, is that it's like, it's a lot about perception, a lot about these uh, qualities of things. <laughs> I'm being vague, but it's because I'm just trying to give you a sense for this way that, well, we have, we, okay, we, yeah, yeah, we have this saying, in English, that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Well, perhaps adornment is in the eye of the beholder, not the earrings on the person, but the in the eye of the beholder. And actually, I didn't even, I should have thought of that earlier, but maybe I shouldn't have, but that I think is very much about what this vision is about regarding sort of a, the way a bodhisattva views people in that way. And yes, I, without going back, yes, the, this male described as male bodhisattva perceiving women as described as women, but the point remains the same though, is that I think it's about a transformation of viewing and a new kind of viewing. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's definitely a big part of it. And, and all of these visions, of course, have been about a new kind of viewing. Viewing the world as filled of jewels versus filled with plastic trash or something like that. A world filled with jeweled lotus flowers a world filled, you know, the third one's a little tricky, right? A, a world filled with armor and cudgels and enemies, not quite. We don't want to go there, but it's definitely a world filled with fearlessness. Let's put it that way for that one. A world filled with rare flowers scattered everywhere and a world filled with crowned adorned beings, you know. Okay. Questions, comments, ideas? You know, I, I, was, 
I had planned on addressing the topic of the divine feminine because it seemed a little relevant, but I feel like we did a good job at covering it in a way, both in terms of its problems and its whatever value in that way. Anybody about that? Yeah, no. Not about that, I, I, or well, maybe it is. I, I wonder how this connects to the fifth boomy and the hard to master. I'm not having oh. great insight into that. You saved me, you saved us. <laughs> you did, because it, it would have been a pointless, absolutely pointless Dharma talk. Um, okay, so this is where I can uh, actually give you something <laughs> tonight, tonight. So the idea of difficult to master, hard to master, sadurjaya, the bodhisattva who abides in this stage where they are a master of dhyana, here's the thing. The reason why a bodhisattva is hard to master if they reach this stage is you can imagine, and, and I'm gonna try to say this very clearly, sorry, very clearly. It's about, you know, if a bodhisattva at this stage really has total control over their sensual desire. The idea is, is that that bodhisattva becomes very hard, if not impossible to stir. Most of us have vested interests in things. And so we are very easily stirred. This dhyana, impartiality, is a very special place to be because when the bodhisattva has no vested interest in this or that and is truly equanimous, it becomes hard to scare them. It becomes hard to buy them out. It's like it becomes hard to get them to, to corrupt their, it's like they're, they're impervious and imperturbable and indomitable but entirely from a disposition of equanimity. It's such a powerful teaching. It's such a powerful idea, which is the idea that, oh, there's all these people out there hoarding wealth, hoarding acquisitions, putting up barbed wire fences, all of this in order to feel indomitable. Or the bodhisattva move, which is, and you become indomitable. But the idea, of course, is you have to really be a bodhisattva, though. You can't pretend like you don't have a vested interest in X, Y, or Z when you really do, right? But my point is, is that there is this relationship. And, and again, I'm going to revert uh, back just a little bit to this idea that, you know, we're 2000 BC, give or take, when this sutra is, is, is written. And so I think they are still dealing a little bit with the idea of, of course, sexuality and the sexual drive in that way. And the idea, of course, is that the bodhisattva in the stage of sadurjaya has total mastery and control over those sensual desires to the point where the vision of the opposite sex is one of adornments and crowns rather than objects of ogling, objects of objectification, all of that. So I hope that kind of ties that together about how possibly this all relates. Diana being difficult, uh, a stage difficult to master, and then this vision. A tricky puzzle to put together, but I think we did an okay job. 
Wonderful. Um, those are all my notes. There's just, a, you know, other, I just, you know, wanted to mention that there's a little bit of similarity between this vision and in particular representations of Pranya Paramita, um, who also has what looks like a triple crown bodily adorned. I don't know if there is any uh, relationship there, but I wanted to point it out. Otherwise, I think that's it for the fifth vision of the Bodhisattva. Thanks, Noe. Thanks, Connie. Thank you, everybody. Awesome. Thank you, Michael. Oh, so happy to do it. So happy to be here. That's it. Then we're going to pause there until next week when we do the vision before we go to the sixth stage. <laughs>